uh, we're Code Liberation. Uh, we're each going to do a few minutes, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the different things we've done this year. So welcome to Code Liberation Foundation, the Star Wars edition. So we're going to start with the origin story, and this is Kat Small. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Kat Small. I am a user experience designer, developer, game maker. Um, I mainly teach the web development, uh, web game dev classes uh, at Code Liberation. So uh, in addition to all of these things, I am also uh, a former tomboy, I guess. Um, as a kid, uh, I was always called you know, a tomboy. I loved games. I loved comic books and all kinds of things that people said were for boys. Um, I especially loved the Power Rangers. It was like my favorite thing. And I had like the Red Ranger, because red was my favorite color, not pink. <laughs> Um, I hated My Little Pony, um, um, so every time I see like one of these like Friends type shows now, I'm always just like I'm gonna vomit in a corner because I was just like I was just that kid, that girl who was just like I hate all these girl things. Um, boys had all the cool things; um, they had all the super cool toys. All the the shows were aimed at them. They just seemed to have all the things that were really awesome that um, girls didn't. So I heavily rejected being, you know, the, the idea of like girliness. And um, several of these other ladies here actually did the same thing. <laughs> so this was like a girl toy. It was like big and pink and cute and about babies or <laughs> about tea parties, all kinds of like, you know, cute pink things, you know, with friends and family and stuff. But I really wanted these instead. <laughs> I wanted to have the super soakers and like the cool Hot Wheels cars and the toy trains and like even the, the cool like three foot long like real fake car thing um, and basketballs and all kinds of stuff. I just, I just loved everything that boys had and like they had every other color besides pink and I just thought that was awesome. And then this also extended into our culture. So um, I grew up in the 90s, and a lot of different like things in the 90s were about like fighting over boys, or about wanting a boy to come back to you, or just to have one, <laughs> um, or someone cheating on you. And so it's like a fight between other women because you know this someone took this guy from you, and you just feel there was always like this constant fight for men. And I just couldn't deal with that. I thought girls were way too dramatic. Um, and I, I definitely sought out a lot of other girls who were similar to me, but I also didn't really trust them because I always felt like, uh, because of all these things I'd seen, that girls can't be trusted. They're always a threat and they'll take things from you and they'll stab you in the back. And this was all just things that I learned from, from watching TV. Um, so most of my friends were guys uh, for a very long time, um, even as recent as college. So uh, it was mostly because it was like, these were the people who were going to play games with me. And I could talk about comics with them and like all kinds of just cool, fun stuff that I really liked more than being friends. Or not being friends, but like tea parties. <laughs> um, so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, one of my friends actually said this to me. He said, men have honor and women have no such thing. And I thought that was a little offensive, um, but also kind of interesting because in a way it's kind of true. Society trains us to, to not respect women and to not uh, respect their words or honor them as people and to think that they have real decisions or are interested in things besides babies and tea parties. So um, it's just something that we're constantly told we have to do. We have to hate each other. We have to fight each other. Um, society sort of like uh, urges us to, to spread women out instead of uh, become a community and really work together. So um, it's sort of, it's in everything. And as you can sort of see here, society just like pushes us to be like, this amazing, sexy, tiny goddess who like does nothing but like have sex and like know the perfect moves for her guy and like the perfect style and just Dakota Fanning. I'm so sorry you ha you had to happen like this, but <laughs> I loved Dakota Fanning as a kid. I was just like she's so cool and she's like smart and awesome and I don't know. But you know, even 
as the person that she is now, she's like hot and sexy. I'm hoping she's also really cool and smart. Um, but this was the kind of person I really admired <laughs> as a kid. Um, I wanted more people like these. I wanted the Darias of the world. I wanted to like know these other girls who were like cynical and kind of like, you know, they just felt really human. And the portrayal of girls that I got when I was a kid was just like, they just want like a couple of things. They want a man, they want a family, they want a baby. And that's like, they don't really have any interest in anything else. Um, and girls would never like games. Why would they ever do that? Um, and that's why I really think CodeLib is so important to our community. Um, we are just gathering all the nerdy women <laughs> and telling them that they're normal and that they have a place and that it's okay to support each other and there's no reason to, to fight. Um, it's, we're really just showing the importance of being together and working and, and sort of embracing each other and, and pushing for, for a better community. So join us in our uh, push for more women in games and just more community support. Yay. <laughs> so hello, I'm Phoenix Perry, and I'm the Code Liberation founder. And uh, since this is a Star Wars edition, I decided to kick it off this way. I felt a great disturbance in the force as, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. I fear something terrible has happened. Women make up a mere 4% of game programmers. Women make up around 25% of programmers overall. Well, you might think that that's not so bad, right? Wrong. <laughs> Truth, it's worse now than it ever has been before. This is the Bureau of Labor Statistics since 1991. I would like you to note the falling decline of programmers in the United States that are women. That's the chart specifically gender broke down. And if uh, you look at the whole field and you strip it back to just the number of programmers, in 1987, 42% of American programmers were women. Women have a long lineage of making significant contributions to the field of computer science. The world's first programmer, a woman. This is Ada Lovelace, born in, 19, er, in 1815. Uh, uh, and she's the daughter of Lord Byron, and she worked to create the very first computer program for Charles Babbage's uh, early differential equation machine. Right? Um, so anyway, women um, programmed most all of the early computers as part of the war effort. Uh, the compute her was this common idea, um, and it was a job largely reserved for women who basically crunched large numbers. Um, so this is the NACA high-speed si uh, flight simulation computer room in 1949. Associated with typing and secretarial duties, programming was even considered women's work. This is Cosmopolitan from 1987, or 1967. Um, if it doesn't sound like women's work, well, it just is. And this is a female programmer talking about her job uh, in Cosmopolitan. Um, and why the dramatic switch? And I've been doing some research into this, and I'm going to say it's the personal computer and all the advertising that went right along with it. So um, it was an expensive item, so who did they target? Um, they targeted the breadwinner, uh, the family breadwinner. Uh, the advertising took sexism to a whole new level, and it created this impression that computers were not for women. Um, this is what Apple's ads look like, <laughs> Commodore's ads. Um, oh, it gets so much worse, just wait. Um, this is, you know, Sinclair, a man with his son. Um, this is the, you know, TRS-80. And this is at a time where women were, like, really dominant in the field. Um, Apple even started running these ads called, uh, saying what kind of man owns his, fa uh, owns his own computer. And they did a whole suite of founding father ads. Um, and then they got about, they, they went to about here. So uh, don't feel bad, our servers won't go down on you either. Um, and this advertising tactic must have been a success because it ramped up to an extreme in gaming in the 90s when people like Kat were growing up. And gaming was depicted as something only little boys or men did. And these ads were either male dominated or disturbingly misogynistic. Wait for it. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the angle. Um, yeah. So, uh, Game Boy, Marathon, then a ferret down. These ran in kids' magazines. Um, 
the new Game Boy Pocket, seriously distracting. I don't even know what this is. Uh, <laughs> Sega 32-bit processor. Um, this one, yeah, yeah. How did they? This is pretty classic Game Boy. Uh, she's crying, but her her husband slash boyfriend's too busy playing to uh, help her out, so he passes her a tissue with his foot. Uh, he's just put it in his crotch here, which I think is, <laughs> you know, just stop, just just don't, you know, just go for it. Uh, and the problem with this is women make up nearly half of all gamers, uh, yet game and technology companies just have not retargeted their advertising. So GTA, easy offender, sorry, I had to. Dell, uh, Facebook suggested I like this. Uh, it's easy on your eyes and your wallet. Uh, go big or go home, this was 2012. Uh, Dell now available and beautiful. <laughs> uh, this year at the Game Developers Conference, uh, you guys all, as m many of you know this, last year I uh, was one of the finalists along with Jane in the IndieCade uh, Game Jam and PlayStation took us to uh, the GDC, which was amazing and wonderful and they treated us really well. But while I was in the booth, guys kept coming up to me and they would essentially give me a programming quiz on the spot, and they didn't even consider that it was possible that I had been the game developer. And when I was said that I had worked on the code, they would start quizzing me. Um, and what did Vita's Europe ads look like at the time? I don't even know how this got past their advertising. It's a way for it. <laughs> so what we have here is an image problem. Um, how do we fix it? We undo the damage, and we woman up. OK. Hi. Yeah. That was Phoenix. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jane Friedhoff, and I get overly excited. I really do. <laughs> About most things, really. But one of the things that I really like is programming. Not necessarily because I love computer science as a field, but because being able to code gives me the freedom to make the kind of games that I want to make. I don't have to rely on someone to make a tool to track screaming so I can make stuff shoot bullets. And I don't really have to work on anyone else's schedule. If I know how to code, I can make the things that I want to make when I want to make them. So I actually got a chance to teach coding at Parsons when I was doing my MFA program there. I taught an MFA level class. And I taught a lot of people who really had no experience with code before. right? So um, they came from all these different backgrounds. Many of them felt very apprehensive about learning how to code. And it was just really rewarding to see their faces light up when they made something that they could interact with. And it really wasn't as difficult as they thought. So this is something I really enjoyed. So when Phoenix told me about that whole 4% issue, um, that seemed really ridiculous to me. And I thought, OK, maybe I can use some of my teaching experience to this end. So at Code Liberation, our motto is basically no coder left behind. Our events are designed for total beginners. We take our time. We never assume prior knowledge of anything. All of our materials are freely available online. We post them on our GitHub. And our inboxes are always open. I have been known to write really, really long code emails at like midnight. Um, so you can do that if you want. Um, our goal is to provide a supportive, attentive atmosphere for women of all backgrounds to learn how to code. So we run a couple of categories of events. The first, as you might guess, are classes and workshops. So Back about a year ago, I had to, right? <laughs> about, about a year ago, um, for our first event, we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And we decided to go really ambitious. We decided to make a 10-week long C++ class, and uh, NYU uh, Game Center was actually helping us out with hosting with that. So we were like, all right, let's do this. Let's do this 10-week long C++ class. Let's go big or go home, right? <laughs> so of course, you know, we got signups and things. I was always a little scared. You know, is anyone actually going to show up, right? Are people actually interested in this, or am I just like projecting? Hell yeah, they are. <laughs> this was our turnout for our kind of at an angle. It's extreme. Um, <laughs> this was uh, our turnout for our first C++ class, which was really super exciting. Um, since then, we've run a couple. We've won a bunch of workshops in Game Maker, HTML, JavaScript, Unity, Open Frameworks, and Processing. Well, we will tomorrow. Um, and here are a couple of snapshots of some of our events. This is at NYU Poly. So this is our audience. All told, we've taught over 140 uh, free, 140 hours of free code classes. Here is a little bit of our feedback. I love the fun attitude of the teachers. It made a very intimidating subject exciting and approachable. I like how the class catered to its students, and I always felt comfortable during class. Code Liberation challenged me and kept me interested at the same time, and I couldn't ask for anything more. We also do jams as well, um, which I think are really important because they do a couple of things. 
they help us build community, right? They get people meeting and working together and networking. And not only do they get people making games, but they also get people comfortable with showing their games off. Because that can be a really like limiting factor, right? If you make a game, but then you don't show it to people. Um, so here are a couple shots of some of our jams. We did them again also at Poly. Um, there's plenty of room for forming teams and brainstorming, coding, making assets, taking naps. <laughs> Uh, here are the results of our first game jam. There were four games, all created by teams of women, most of whom had never programmed before in their lives, and our second jam as well. Um, so yeah, it's just been really exciting to see people's faces light up when they demo at our, at our like post-jam events, and people actually get to play with the things that they've made. So yeah, um, our event list is long, and it's only getting longer. In fact, we're running, I, I'm teaching it actually, a workshop here tomorrow at 11 a.m. in the all day seminar room. Uh, and we'd love to see you there. So thanks. Okay. Yeah. Hello, I'm Nina, uh, Nina Freeman. Uh, I run the Code Liberation High School uh, classes. Um, and I've also taught like regular classes as well earlier in the year, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about our high school initiative. Um, okay, so this is a picture of me and a couple of my students. Um, so like we were, like Jane was saying before, we teach coding classes and some of our core classes are in C++ and we often use open frameworks. So I, along with collaboration at NYU Poly um, K through 12 STEM, we uh, hooked up with UAI, which is this high school in Brooklyn. Um, and we are it's actually an all-girls school, and we're inviting those girls to take classes with me on teaching uh, C++ and Open Frameworks introduction class. Um, and it's a five-week course. We meet twice a week. Um, it's for eighth and ninth grade girls. Um, and yeah, so it's really all thanks to NYU Poly and UAI. They're really great. The girls there are amazing. Um, and this is just a picture of the space. Um, and kind of the basic stuff that we cover in this first sort of like run of it um, our like really basic intro stuff. We usually like get up a little past functions and then we start like prototyping really small games. So I think by the end of the first class I had like their final project was each of them had to have a working prototype. Um, and they all did. <laughs> they were all like little like circle games. Um, so it was kind of fun like catch and whatever. just like little like shooter games. Um, but it was really exciting because none of these girls had ever programmed before. Um, especially because their school actually doesn't offer any programming classes. In fact, many schools in the United States don't offer programming classes. Um, I think most of them had only ever learned HTML and that was like it. Um, so the first cohort just finished in the end of November and that's a picture of some of my students and they're really cool. <laughs> um, and so you might be wondering why I'm like sort of spearheading this high school class. Um, so according to Computing in the Core, which is the Hour of Code, the people who organize the Hour of Code, um, which you might have heard about that happened earlier this year. Um, introductory secondary school computer science courses have decreased in number by 17% since 2005, which is like crazy, especially in the environment we live in now where like technology and programming knowledge and literacy, just literacy itself is so important. Um, and this is another statistic from last year's results of the AP computer science um, exam national statistics only 18.6% of the students in high school in the entire United States that took the CSAP test were girls, which is really, really bad. Um, so this is a picture of me <laughs> um, when I was really little. And I guess I have sort of an anecdote for why I like sort of feel really passionately about teaching high school girls how to code. Um, so when I was about this age, I started sort of I was like, what's HTML? <laughs> and uh, I like would see all these like websites and like fan sites to my favorite like video games and anime on the internet. And I was like, also on Neopets. And I was like, oh my God, I have to learn how to make all these websites that all these other cool kids on the internet are doing. Um, so, <laughs> so I started to teach myself HTML and then I started to teach myself PHP. I did this all when I was like 13 and you know, no one was telling me to do this. I just happened to be interested in like nerdy stuff that people like to make websites about on the internet. Um, so, you know, I, I did this like through high school and was like super into making websites and was like, oh, I'm gonna go to school for computer science. Oh my God, it's gonna be so awesome. But then I just stopped. 
So at the end of high school and during high school, I was doing a lot of theater and my mom really wanted me to like go to New York and be an actress. So I totally gave up on like programming um, because everyone was just like, no, no, you're just gonna be an actress. It's like gonna be so good. You're so great. And I was like, okay, I'm like gonna go make these websites and play games. And then it just, I sort of like cut myself off cause I was like, okay, I guess my priorities are changing. Um, and then I became an English major. So, which was great, don't regret it. <laughs> um, so what, I, I always wonder what would have happened if a teacher had encouraged me to continue programming and to pursue the computer science degree that I had originally wanted to do. Um, so I wish that that had happened. Unfortunately, it didn't until after I graduated college when I met people like Phoenix and other people around me that were like, oh, you're interested in coding, you should just keep doing it. You love games, you can make games, you can just do that, like why aren't you doing that? And then I started doing it and it felt so powerful. And I really wanna show young girls that like the experience I had where I realized that like my voice and my like the power I found in programming was like, like a tool for good. I wanna show them that their voices are just as important as like anyone else's. Um, Cause often I think young girls aren't told that their voices are important. And I think that that's something that we should tell them. Um, Cause no one told that to me. And then I went off and did something else and I could have been making games for years now, but you know, I was pushed in a different direction, unfortunately. Thankfully I found my way. Um, so if we don't tell girls that their voices are really important, especially when they're in high school, like coming up on college, then they might not realize that their voices are important um, because of things like this. Like these are some of like the biggest game characters that you can think of, right? There's only like a couple girls. And what does that say to the average high school girl? That basically says like, oh, here's this big space marine dude. But where does, where does like a high school girl fit into that? I don't know. Um, but if we encourage and teach high school girls to program and to make games, we can change this image so that their voices are just as equally included as any space marine or hedgehog or whatever. <laughs> um, so I wanna teach girls to make games about themselves. I make a lot of personal games myself. This is a game I just made. I'll be showing it in show and tell right after this called How Do You Do It? It's about a little girl trying to learn about what sex is by using her dolls. And after teaching these high school classes and like listening to the game ideas that these girls have, I realized that they really like to like reach into their own experience. And I think that we're all advocates of diversifying games as like an industry and as a medium. And I think that the more diverse voices we get in games, whether it's women or people of color or anything, it's really important to diversifying the medium because the more kinds of people you have making games, the better and more diverse games there's gonna be. Um, so I think that a really important step in achieving diversity in games is, is helping high school girls learn how to program. And I want to tell them that their voices are important and that they can also make games about their own personal experiences. Um, so now Phoenix will tell you a little bit about the Yellow Threat Society. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thanks guys. Uh, for those of you who wanna hang out after, uh, and our ladies, are, are guys will come too, Ida, or is it just ladies for this? I'd have ran out. Okay, anyway, they're gonna do a lunch later on. Uh, they have a organization for girl gamers, there's us. There are a lot of resources in New York that if you're a woman and you're interested in games, you absolutely have a community and you absolutely have people who care about your titles and your ideas and are encouraging. So, Code Liberation Foundation, this is our, our Twitter handle and you can just come and find us. And we'll be announcing more classes soon. And if you want to take one tomorrow, we have a day-long processing workshop that Jane will be leading and everyone else will be around helping out, making sure that no one gets lost. So thank you, guys. Oh, and we have cards if anyone wants like contact info. So thanks. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and uh, we have some time for questions, which is a miracle. We had 120 some sides. <laughs> so questions? Yeah, go ahead. So hard. Okay. Yep. We can do that. Uh, 
Okay, sure. Yeah, the reason we chose C++ um, is because if you can understand C++, you have all other ECMO languages under your belt. And that idea, the ideas that C++ teaches are fundamentally core to understanding how games work. Um, and it is a really, it, you know, it's a, it's a big jump, but I feel like we, the first thing we did was a 33 hour class. And for 33 hours, I figured the people who, we had about 25 stick all the way through the end. We um, realized around August is when we had the steepest drop off. And we think it's because of the heat and the, and the, like the weather. So last two weeks we had pretty bad fall off, but I think that that had more to do with the fact it was the summer. Um, but until like those last two weeks, we had really good retention. I'd say like 50 something out of like about 70 that showed up originally. And um, so the retention was really good. Some people come some classes and not others. Uh, the biggest thing we realized is if we're gonna do C++ again, we're not gonna do so many hours in sequence like that. We might break it into smaller topics um, just so people don't have to make such a huge time commitment. But the reason we did it is like tear the Band-Aid off, right? Tear the Band-Aid off. And Open Frameworks is a wonderful tool for making indie games. And we really thought, like, let's give them something really useful. And then we figured that the easier stuff, the more introductory stuff, that you could kind of get a lot of bang for your buck, we could do shorter workshops on. And what we found is actually people who came to the C++ class have continued to come back to the other classes, and they've picked it up really quick as a result of, like, understanding basics of object-oriented programming. And when I, I, I thought it was a crazy person idea and asked them and they all backed me on it. So, <laughs> and I think, uh, was it you who had the really good book? Yeah. Yeah, and, and Nina had a really good book and you know, one thing led to another. What was, N huh? what was the book? Oh, uh, Nina? Uh, it was like, it's like the purple introduction to game programming yeah. in C++ book. I forget who, what the publisher is, but it's yeah. purple. <laughs> it's purple. I think Emma Emmett got it for yeah, Nina for a Christmas gift or something. It's a great book though. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, because it's focused on games. Yeah, it's focused on games, and just the way it's written is very, like, it's not, like, hoity-toity, I guess, like a lot of programming books get. It's, like, very down-to-earth and uses a lot of, like, real, like, game examples. So I liked it for that reason. Yeah, things like enemy count. and Yeah. Yeah? It was <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Um, Wait, were there any... Uh, oh, so many. Okay, go ahead. Are there any ladies who wanted to ask questions? Yeah. All right, you in the back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm in touch with most of them. Um, Celia, are you in the room? She stepped out. Okay, Celia Pierce is, uh, sorry, not Celia. Uh, uh, Celia Carver is here. She's, uh, she does dumb Dames Make Games in Toronto. Also, there's Pixels in Montreal. I mean, basically, we're just, I'm meeting them at other conferences I'm going to. And these guys are like, Nina is like a social monster. <laughs> <laughs> she knows like everyone. And it's like, Jane, we're four people. Like, and we've been around six months. And we have managed to like sell 500 tickets and run 140 hours of classes. And I've been living on an airplane. So I really functionally don't know how uh, this is happening. <laughs> it's, just, it's just us, by the way. Yeah. Just the us. Only yeah, like the four of us. We teach all the classes, and we like organize everything. It's just so, us. so if yeah. you want to get involved, yeah. <laughs> down here, <laughs> and uh, and you, you, come on. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm friends with those guys. Okay. They're awesome. <laughs> no, but I know Dave and his his wife. Um, and you mean the one here in the city, right on second? Just in general. Yeah, that's awesome. There were so many initiatives for, originally, I'm, I, I, I have to honestly say my target was a little bit older because my experience Nina's experience, Kat's experience, and Jane's experience is we all were really interested in computers when we were younger, were really discouraged, didn't do comp sci degrees, and came back to gaming. And I really wanted to find those women and help them on that path back to themselves in a, in a, in a way. Um, but Nina really has a very strong passionate for little girls, so I think she should talk about that. 
I actually didn't know that. <laughs> but that sounds really awesome. And yeah, I'm teaching like high school girls at the one high school right now, just because that's like, because I'm doing my master's at NYU. They're offering me space. That high school's around the corner. So it's like really easy for them to come as like part of an after school program. Um, but I'll definitely look into that because I think now I'm starting to run more advanced classes for those high school girls. And I'm hoping that, you know, I'm going to, there's only so many girls in the school. <laughs> so I'm going to have to like branch out at some point. Um, so that's a really interesting idea. Thanks for telling us. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, basically, like, women have been really heavily um, involved in the computer science field. And, like, for example, um, Courant, uh, NYU's computer science school is run by women. Um, in fact, you actually find before that dip, that spiked down in 91, there was, like, a ridiculous number of female programmers who went to academia. So my experience with if you take computer science um, is that you often do run into a lot of those older maven women who kind of kick the field off uh, in academic settings. I think what's just happened recently um, is that there's been this like massive media barrage of hate is the only way I can kind of think of it. Um, like if you look at Cosmo from 1967 and the cover of Cosmo that Kat showed, it's just really, it's really obvious. And I think that as a society, we have just got to like lay the law down. And I, I think that the time has come for women to really stand out and talk about that. Do you, you want to say anything about that, Nina? I think in the school setting, there's like, it's interesting because I feel like girls fight like a lot of, a, or they don't even fight them because they, there's just like a lot of assumptions about like what kinds of like electives girls are going to take in high school. Um, and also on top of the fact that there just isn't enough computer science education in like high school or elementary school when there should be. So I think between the assumptions about what kinds of things girls should be interested in and also the lack of computer science classes themselves, those just sort of compound into like the dreadful statistics you saw before. Um, and I think with people like the Hour of Code, there's people working to try and change that. So hopefully we'll see a difference and we won't see that percentage drop more and more. Um, but, you know, we're trying to change that slowly. Okay. So. And one of the, and then we'll take one more question. But before I do that, I've got you in the back. But I just want to say one of the most shocking things I've noticed in code liberation is the number of scientists we get who are women that actually couldn't get through the computer science classes because of exactly what we're talking about. I'm like, how'd you get a postdoc in like neuroscience and can't code? How'd that happen? All right, um, you in the back. Uh, what do you, you have to say? Yeah, speak way up. Yeah, the sad thing that breaks my heart is that when you look at the sciences, it's actually the opposite problem. We, we, we don't have a STEM problem. We have an image problem. Um, if, if you look at the history in the field, we've actually seen mass decline in STEM uh, with women. And, and I think that computer science and games are a really great door in. And I think one of the interesting things to focus on right now is narrative and storytelling. Because I think little girls naturally love to tell stories. And if, I think that there's like a huge terrain for, for getting their voices heard and, and getting them interacting with each other. But re-STEM, I think that games are just a tremendously interesting and fun way in the door. And from, once you learn to code, man, everything, like, you know, biology is just, you know, living code. So I, I think that there's like a lot of, there, there could be a, a lot of cross put there. Um, but maybe not necessarily, I don't know. No answer. I'm not an expert in this stuff. Anybody else, STEM? <laughs> Hey, dude, I'm just an artist and made games. <laughs> um, anyone else? And that's it, right? We're done? Yeah. We're done? One more? Did you want me to do one more or done? Okay. One more. All right. Okay. Obviously, I'm not a woman, but I'm a member of the queer community. Awesome. A lot of what you're talking about. Uh -huh. is it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you guys already said you're trans-inclusive, which is amazing. Yep. D 
dude, you should just start what we're doing for your community. I We're just too limited. Like, frankly, if I had extra arms, then I would consider doing that. But, like, I'm one person. You guys need to kick that off or, you know, you ladies, how, wherever you want to go in that field, you you should do it. Like, you should just totally kick that off because, like, there's a massive need for it. And I think that societal pressures there are incredibly different and incredibly varied, and your experiences are going to be incredibly unique to your population, and that somebody needs to embrace that community in this way and encourage them. So if anyone here wants to do that, <laughs> you'll have all our love. <laughs> Thank you guys so Thanks. Much. Uh.